Good morning. Did anybody have turkey? You know what turkey makes you want to do? This is not a Sunday afternoon nap. Wait till Sunday afternoon, please. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to the house of God. Ushers are standing by to greet our guests. Thank you, gentlemen. Come forward. If you're a guest in our service, we welcome you. And we are all guests in the house of God. But thank you. If you've not filled out a visitor card for us, um, let us get acquainted with you. Raise your hand and get a visitor card. Anybody? Um, thank you. Thank you for being here. And trust that you have said your thanks many times to God this week. But we can say thank you again this morning, can't we? And... Uh, out on the tree in the welcome center, uh, I checked at the beginning of Sunday school, there were, there were nine or ten angels out there um, for you to select. Be sure when you choose one, you put your name on the list so we know that, uh, what, what, which one you got and uh, the schedule. Um, bring, those, bring those angels back and uh, uh, bring the gift back so that we can uh, give them out. Uh, to the children of, uh, of prisoners, and all of those children are right here in Washington County. And it gives us a chance to reach out into our community with God's love and grace. We heard from the Cliftons a few weeks ago, but it was a Bible message more than a report about their work in, uh, uh, in Hong Kong and in China and so uh, Carrie will be here with us on Wednesday night in the uh, auditorium Bible class this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, we'll have some Bible study, and then we'll turn it over to, uh, to Carrie to give a report on what God is doing in that part of the world. And it's an important area for our prayer and concern, and uh, lots is going on in Hong Kong, and uh, we need to remember uh, that area in prayer and uh, wisdom for the authorities there. Um, so learn more and pray about that on Wednesday night. Um, we start our prayer time at 6.30 and our Bible study and uh, report at 7 o'clock uh, here in the auditorium. Uh, there is an insert, and Kevin may say more about the, uh, uh, the Christmas program on Sunday morning, December 15, but my job is to tell you we're going to have dinner. We're going to have dinner. We're going to eat after church. Now, we'll eat together that Sunday. We'll probably eat after church today, too. Uh, we just didn't bring food. What, we should have all brought our leftovers, right? But uh, December 15th, uh, two weeks from the day, bring food to share. We'll go down to the gym and eat together and enjoy some fellowship uh, after our morning worship service. And uh, Kevin, what do you want to say about the program of that day? Uh, just to make sure to invite folks to come. The gospel is going to be presented pretty clearly. That's our goal. I know um, some, some friends, uh, family members might have other places where they're committed to on Sunday morning. But if you know a coworker or a family member who doesn't attend church or, or who doesn't have a regular place to go, let them know about this concert and, and uh, invite them to come so that they can hear the gospel. And the decorating uh, schedule is here in the bulletin as well. We'll decorate the auditorium on Thursday, December 12. Um, so uh, information about that is in the bulletin, and if you'll make a uh, note about that. There's several other things. Uh, just read your bulletin and catch up with all of, all of those events. Uh, one more quick one from me because it's different from your bulletin, um, and that's that the gym night tonight, we already texted you, but the gym night tonight is going to bump back to 5 p.m. Um, and we'll provide some food. Not a full meal, so some of you teen guys might need to eat something before you come. Others might be okay. Just depends on you. Uh, but we'll provide some food. Uh, 5 o'clock, is it 8.30 that it's going to end? I think 8.30. So 5 to 8.30. And then Christmas concert rehearsal for those involved in the Christmas concert. We just need the musicians and the singers tonight at 6.30. So musicians and singers tonight at 6.30 for rehearsal. That's all I have. Let's stand together. Once we're up, 
and ready. Uh, we'll read scripture together. A Christmas passage from Genesis chapter 3. Huh? Christmas? I thought that was all in the Gospels. Everything that happened in the Gospels was promised in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And that promise unfolds throughout the entire Old Testament. We'll be looking at some of those Old Testament passages during our worship services over the next few weeks where Christ's uh, arrival and his work against the serpent was promised. Let's read together out loud Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you, the devil, and the woman, Eve, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Oh, come let us adore Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore sing and heaven and and nature sing joy to the earth the Savior reigns let men their songs employ while fields and floods rocks, hills and plains repeat the sounding joy Repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. For as the curse is found, for as, for as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace, and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love we'll play that again greet the folks around you this morning
I'm impressed we have that many people here today without a meal, so I, I can hardly wait. I was reading and studying a little bit this week about the names of God. It's a fascinating study, and it's, of course, not unique, but it's a valuable study. The names of God in the Old Testament exist, I believe, in every time in regards to a particular need. God of peace, I've, I hear I've been confirmed. <laughs> Happy birthday, by the way. <laughs> Pastor Paul, is uh, birthday is tomorrow? I hope I'm right. <laughs> you were born. <laughs> but it just struck me as how wonderful it is that we begin the celebration of the culmination of the God who is there for us in every need in salvation at this time of the year. Um, I can't see very far, so if Emily is here, I give you credit for something you posted this week. Um, lady, actually, I listen to ladies. There's one over there. Um, that's what's funny about that. <laughs> Wisdom is personified as a woman who was saying, you know, as Christians, do we act as though we think God is a liar? Do we really believe what we say in the word of God? And that's very challenging. But at this time of the year, which is such a holy time, I wonder, the scriptures being under such attack, if that's not a good challenge for every one of us to remember the reason for the season, as they say. So as we begin that, let's give praise to the Lord and thanks. Father, your word tells us so much about you and yet I only speak personally, there's just so much that I, I cannot comprehend about who you are, what you've done, the greatness of it. Yes, you've told us all we need to know. Yes, I know that. But I look in the heavens, and I see your creation, and I see how small we are. And I'm reminded that you, Father, sent your son to be born in the lowliest of places. And I am so grateful that you sent him to be born in the lowliest of places in my heart, the manger of my heart, as it were. I thank you for that. This is a Thanksgiving season, so often overlooked. I'm afraid, but here we know who you are. We worship you. We give you thanks. It's incomprehensible. It's a mystery. And as human beings, we are so prone to want to understand everything. There's some things we can't understand. Your mercy and your grace are truth. Thank you for that. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenlies, in the heavenly places, and promised us that we will be with you in heaven. There's much we don't understand in this world, but you're the great weaver 
we don't see the tapestry from the front, we see it from the back right now, it looks pretty confused. But yet, you're not taken by surprise. You see our lives, a tale that is told, you know the end from the beginning. And we come to you with that confidence. And Lord, with the example in the New Testament of the man who said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Sometimes we have to say that. We come to you thanking you for your grace, thanking you that you loved us, you died for us, but particularly at this time of the year, you were born as one of us. Thank you, Lord. I pray that as we worship you this season, as we study through the Old Testament, we will see the pictures that culminate in our salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can worship you today, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We can know that you are with us. And although it sometimes seems so small to say, because we are feeble and frail as dust. We love you, we thank you. We praise you for the word of God which is taught here. Pray that we'll grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior who was born for us. And in his name we pray, for Christ's sake, amen.
Thank you, Rita. I wonder, I, I was wondering while Rita was playing, um, what it would have been like to be a fly on the wall and listen to the very first conversation in glory between Mary and Eve. We just read from Genesis chapter 3 where God promised Eve that one of your descendants will crush the serpent. That's a Christmas promise. And then uh, for Mary to, to go to glory at, at the time when she went to glory and for them to meet, what that conversation would have been like. The mother of all living and the mother of our Lord would have been neat. Um, we're going to sing a song called God Has Come to Earth. I'd like you to listen to the verse. Let's do verse 1 and jump straight to the chorus, team. Um, and then we'll stop at the end of that chorus and we'll give a chance for everybody to stand up and we'll sing through the whole thing together. So try to, try to catch it by listening to the first verse and chorus as a sample. All praise to you, eternal Lord, clothed in a God of flesh and blood. You chose a manger for your throne. All worlds on worlds are yours alone. They sing glory in the highest. There is no other name by which we can be saved. Glory in the highest, heaven and earth forever will proclaim, God has come to earth. Go ahead and stand. And we'll start it from the top. Ready? All praise to you, eternal Lord, clothed in a God of flesh and blood. You chose a manger for your throne, while worlds on worlds are yours alone. Once did the skies before you bow. A virgin's arms cradle you now And angels who in you rejoice Now listen for your infant voice They sing glory in the highest There is no other name by which we can be saved Glory in the highest, heaven and earth forever will proclaim, God has come to earth. Oh little child, you are our guest, that weary ones in you may rest. Forlorn and lowly is your birth That we may rise to heaven from earth Singing glory in the highest There is no other name by which we can be saved Glory in the highest Heaven and earth forever will proclaim, God has come to earth. Oh, come let us adore Him. Oh, come let us adore Him. Oh, Come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Glory in the highest. There is no other name 
by which we can be saved. Glory in the highest, heaven and earth forever will proclaim. Glory in the highest, there is no other name by which we can be saved. There's no other name by which we can be saved And heaven and earth forever will proclaim God has come to
was born. Oh, no. for time's sake, Silent Night. Children's Church, the rest can be dismissed. I mean, seated. <laughs> I want to stay for the sermon. <laughs> you might want to stay. Good morning again. Find your portion of the Word of God. And turn with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians. This morning we'll be in chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're in a group the other day, uh, uh, and you were supposed to tell two truths and a lie. Uh, two truths and a lie, and one of the, the truths that Trudy told was she had been chased by a bull. You ever been chased by a bull? Uh, it seems that she, let's see, Trudy, you were uh, flying a kite in granddaddy's pasture, and it wasn't the kite that got the bull on the run, and Trudy too. It was her red sweatshirt. So you wore red even back then. And, and the bull came after her, and over the fence she went in a hurry. Two men had been out in a pasture, and a bull came after them. And uh, they were too far away from the fence. And so one guy says to the other, you need to pray. And the other guy said, well, I don't know what, how to pray. And he said, pray, you got to pray. And he said, well, I only know one prayer, my daddy used to say. So when we bowed our head at the table, and he'd say, uh, Oh, Lord, for what we're about to receive, make us truly thankful. I, I hope 
that you said thanks to God this weekend. And I want to encourage you to keep doing that and uh, to take what you may have said to others and say it to God in prayer. Billy Bray was an old uh, miner in England in years past. And, and in the fall, the time had come before the frost and the freeze to dig the potatoes. Uh, y'all remember that? Still dig potatoes? And he started digging potatoes, and the potatoes were so little. And uh, the devil nudged him and said, There you go, Billy. That's the pay you get for serving your heavenly Father. I mean, think of all you've done this year, and look at those small potatoes. The ever devil ever try to convince you that serving God gave small potatoes? Billy said, uh, Oh, Satan, there you are again talking against my father. Bless his name. Why, when I served you, I didn't even get potatoes. So if you had potatoes this Thanksgiving, whatever you had, there's cause to say thank you. Praise God. Satan, you know, Satan doesn't want to hear us. Praise God, does he? So if you've done that this week, and if you do that today, um, then you're giving the devil a run. Send him on his way. He wants to hear. You know what the devil likes us to do? Grumbling and complaining. Anybody got anything to say this morning? My goodness. God help us. The Apostle Paul has three short commands for us this morning. Let's read them. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16 is the first one. Rejoice always. Verse 17, the second. Pray without ceasing. Verse 18. Give Thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, those aren't hard to understand. They are a lot harder to obey, aren't they? They're not hard to read, they're hard to heed. Doing these things is where we find the problem. Now, we might think it's pretty natural to rejoice when things are going well. Rejoice always. Things are going well, is that the easy thing to do? You know, we're kind of like the first family We don't always even rejoice when things are going well. Think of of that first family, Adam and Eve, back in the garden. Do you remember what they had? They had a beautiful place to live. Don't we live in a beautiful place here in southwest Virginia? They, They had a beautiful place to live in the garden. A home of indescribable bliss and beauty and plenty. They they were in charge of everything. Wouldn't it be great to be in charge of everything? Well, maybe. They were Lord of all of God's creation. And they had been made in the image of God. And so they they had fellowship with God. And God walked with them in in the cool, cool of the garden. They've been granted a lot of freedom. Listen to what God had said to them. God said, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the one tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. What freedom? Choose anything but this one 
They had, Adam and Eve had great joy, I believe, until the devil came and started talking to them. And you know what the devil wants to convince us? He wants to convince us that God doesn't really love us. God isn't really good to us. I mean, look at this one thing God hasn't given you you want so bad. And so we've decided that God is bad. That's what Satan convinced Adam and Eve, that God wasn't good, that he was holding out on them. And so I think Adam and Eve lost their joy when they listened to the devil. So who are you listening to? Are you a joyful Christian? You may be listening to the wrong voice if you're not. Now, so what's natural? It's natural to complain. But it's supernatural to rejoice. So fill in the blank there. Uh, Roman numeral one, rejoice always, letter A. What is natural and what is supernatural? You know, you just pay attention to the people around you, and it's pretty natural to complain. But God's people ought to do the supernatural thing. God's people ought to rejoice always. So Adam and Eve are certainly a biblical example. That's the letter B. Who is a biblical example of each one? Well, Adam and Eve, wouldn't you say, they would be an example of doing the natural thing. They had everything but one tree, and they weren't satisfied. But think of the Apostle Paul. Think of what life was like for him. Listen to what Paul says. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. He said, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Now, I'm reading from the book of Philippians. Nineteen times Paul mentions joy in that book. If you need a book about rejoicing, read Philippians. But when you read it, pay attention to what was happening to the Apostle Paul. Do you remember? He was in Rome, a long way away from home. And he was in prison. He was bound in chains. In his own house, yes, but he was not free to go where he wished to go. A soldier was by his side day and night. His freedoms had been taken away from him. His trial was either going on or about to begin. And in the midst of this, Paul says, I rejoice. And he says to us, rejoice in the Lord always. You need to hear that. Which one are you like? You more like Adam and Eve? Wanting more? Black Friday's a good weekend to want more, right? You didn't get all you wanted. You paid more than you want. Boy, the, the world wants to convince us. Satan wants to convince us that God hasn't given us all the good things we need. But he has, hasn't he? He's given us Jesus and eternal life and, and heaven to boot. You know, wait till you see the caboose on this train we're riding. Heaven at the end of the ride. Wow. What a wonderful privilege we have as God's children. And yet, we're kind of like Adam and Eve. We just kind of rejoice about what? Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice always Paul makes it so simple so what do you think keeps people from rejoicing I put that question number letter c what robs us of our joy well people do sometimes right (laughs) 
ever, ever get down in the mouth because of people. Things. If it breaks, it can make us, it can break us. And turn that smile right upside down. Things, people, circumstances. Well, it rained all night. It, the sun didn't come up till a little while ago. How easy it is for Satan to steal our joy. But it's not necessary. God's people can choose to rejoice always. And that's what, what we are called to do. Chuck Swindoll grew up in a, in a laughing family. And one night they were having so much fun, his mama went over and closed the window. She said, we're going to keep the neighbors up. And the phone rang. And a little girl next door said, what would you close the windows for? Oh, we didn't want to bother you. Bother us? That's the most laughter we've heard in a long time. Can you raise your window back? Or do the neighbors, when they hear you, Making noise, is it laughter they hear? Rejoicing they hear? God help us. Now sometimes our circumstances aren't such that we would naturally be joyful. But one of the things that catches the eye of the world around us is when they see us going through difficult situations like the Apostle Paul and in our lives we are joyful despite the difficulties of life. There was a martyr in the third century by the name of Cyprian. He wrote a letter to a friend by the name of Donatus. And here's what Cyprian wrote. He said, This seems to be a cheerful world, Donatus, when I view it from the fair garden under the shadow of, of these vines. But if I climb up on some great mountain and look over the wide lands, you know very well what I would see. I would see armies on the high roads and pirates on the seas and and in the amphitheater, men murdered to please the applauding crowd. And under all roofs, misery and unselfishness. He's saying, <coughs> if you look around, you can see plenty of, of things that would lead you to discouragement, despair, and sadness. He says, it's a really bad world, Donatus, an incredibly bad world. Yet, in the midst of it, I have found a quiet and holy people. They have discovered a joy that is a thousand times better than any pleasure in this life. Oh, they're despised and persecuted but they care not they have overcome the world these people are Christians and I am one of them God help us to be like those third century Christians that see the world as a difficult place but because of God's presence in their lives because of a fellowship with God and God's people and the Holy Spirit living within and the burden of sin removed and, and the joy that comes from the Holy Spirit and heaven as our eternal. You, you could add to that list, couldn't you? Because of all those things, circumstances don't matter for God's people. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Rejoice always take that one home try it out that's a good word from the apostle paul for us i call it a diamond drop here grab this one rejoice 
always. Paul has two more for us. He says in verse 17, pray without ceasing. You know anybody with a cough? You ever had one of those kinds? That <coughs> that's literally the word here. Pray like you got a hack and cough. I mean, just pray and pray and pray and pray. And you just can't stop. You just can't quit. It just keeps going. Paul is saying we ought to pray like that. Now, obviously. Letter A, what is required by this command is not that we get on our knees 24 hours a day and voice, use our voice to, to pray to God. We can't do that. There's, life, life has more demands than that. But we can pray like we cough, just continuously, constantly, repeatedly, praying and praying and praying. Edsel, when he was living, and I had our gardens side by side. He lived in the big white house here. And uh, once in a while, when I was planting some plants, putting them out, some little seedlings, I needed a bucket of water. And so I would go over to the little garage beside his house, and I would grab the handle of that pump that sat beside the garage is red uh, you know you've seen those pumps around on farms in different places and you just raise the handle and give it a a lick and out comes water now if it hadn't been used in a while sometimes you have to go oh, oh, you know but that's the kind of prayer that should characterize our life is just jerk pull up the handle and pew, here comes the water squirting filling our lives with a constant flow of prayer pray without ceasing i read a story about a christian who'd gone fishing now i didn't say on sunday but he'd gone fishing and he's out fishing and the storm comes and and it's a bad one and and he and his buddy think oh no our boat's going to sink. And his buddy says, you're a Christian, you need to pray. And he said, oh, no, 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 not me. He said, yeah, yeah, you should pray. So well, I haven't prayed in 15 years. Well, you got to do it now. Ask God to get us safely to shore. He said, okay, 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 okay. He said, oh, Lord, I haven't asked you for anything in 15 years. And if you get me safely to shore, I promise I won't pray again for 15 more. <laughs> That's not what God wants. Jesus said, ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. God invites us. The door is open. Come in to his presence and present your praise and your prayers. Paul is reminding us. What does this remind us about prayer, letter B? It reminds us there's no place where you can't pray. Did you find a place where you couldn't pray? No, no. There's no place. There's no, no time. Is there any time of the day or night when, when you can't pray? No. Any place, any time. Is there any burden, any need, any any request, any blessing, any thanksgiving you can't bring to God? No. So it sounds pretty open. Pray without ceasing, anytime, any place, about anything. Just pray and pray and, and pray and pray and, and keep on praying. Now, we ought to have specific times when we pause to spend some extra time with God in prayer I saw this weekend a, a door and on the uh, on the door was a little note meditation room 
And I wondered when I saw it, how often does this get used? Meditation room. Wouldn't it be great if we did what, what Jesus tells us? He says, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret Real will reward you. There's so many places where we can pray. Used to, you know, I love to pray in the car because you, you didn't get disturbed. You go for a ride, you go, you have a little drive, a 30 minutes or a 15 minutes or where, you know, and you felt like, okay, but, but now, beep, 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 beep. And sometimes you just got to, okay, when you get in your prayer closet, just leave it behind. You know, take time quietly. Pray often. Pray. Pray intensively. Now, did all of y'all get enough to eat on Thanksgiving? Yeah, okay. So somebody took the time to prepare a good meal for you to enjoy. And, and that's kind of like some, some of our prayer sessions ought to be like that. It ought to be pretty intentional. We sit down, we take the time, we, we invest in, in, in prayer, in, in, uh, uh, in A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, and we pray very in, in a very detailed, very very passionate way but sometimes it's kind of like running through the kitchen and grabbing something a leftover roll or a biscuit or a or a bite of this or that and we just grab something to eat on the on the run sometimes prayer ought to be like that just whenever wherever it comes to mind i encourage you if someone asks you to pray about something and you think you would and you think you should, why don't you do it then? That's what I try to do because, oh my goodness, if at the end of the day I tried to remember everything everybody had told me to pray about and I said, well, sure I will, I'm not sure I will. <laughs> so how much better to just stop right then when that request comes, that, that's what we hope you do if you get the prayer chain from the church. And we send out an email prayer chain. And if you're not on it, uh, you can call the office or let me know and we'll get you on it. But the best time to pray for those requests is, boom, right then. Just take 30 seconds. Take 90 seconds. Lift it up to God in prayer. Pray, Paul says, pray without ceasing. That's, that's the way we ought to pray. We ought to be praying constantly, just like we breathe. Have you breathed in the last minute? Did you breathe? Okay, everybody breathe together. On your mark, get set. I, I didn't need to tell you to breathe, right? Did anybody not breathe since you came in here? I don't see anybody in the floor. I guess you all been, been breathing. That's the way we should be in prayer. Just breathing and breathing and breathing out to God our praise, our adoration, our thanksgiving, our confession. When, when's the best time to confess? When? Just like when you hear a prayer request, pray. When you, oh no, there I go. Oh God, forgive me. Do it right then. I mean, how many of us want to save up all of our sins till nighttime? You want to go to bed with that? Oh, my goodness. I'd like to clean it up all day long. Get rid of it as quick as I Oh, God. I, whew, I messed up again. God help us. God forgive us. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. You think that's hard? Get this next one. 
in everything. Or give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Give thanks in all circumstances. Helen Hayes was fixing Thanksgiving dinner. Actress, not cook, Helen Hayes. And uh, she said, now listen, this is the first turkey I ever made. So if it's not good, just let me know and we'll get up from the table and we'll go down to the restaurant and eat. So she went back in the kitchen to get something and she came back and everybody was quietly sitting at the table with their coats and hats on. <laughs> so if they come to the table with the coats and hats on, that might be a sign. Give thanks in all circumstances. Even when we don't get what we want? Really? The little boy was asked by his father to say grace at the table. So, kids, you know, before you say thanks for the food, you ought to look around and see what it is, right? So he did. He looked at that. He looked at that. He looked at that. It obviously wasn't Thanksgiving dinner nor his favorite meal. And then he prayed and he said, Lord, I don't like the looks of it. But I thank you for it, and I'll eat it anyway. Amen. So some of you men might, might uh, memorize this prayer. Let me give it to you again. Lord, I don't like the looks of it. <laughs> but thank you, honey, for it anyway. No, thank you, Lord, for it anyway. Few of us do what this command requires. Give thanks in all circumstances? This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you? I mean, this is not what we normally expect. Alexander White is a Scottish preacher. He wrote a great book that I have in my library, uh, Old Testament and New Testament Bible Characters. Uh, White, W-H-Y. He had a pastoral prayer that encouraged his congregation every Sunday morning. And he would, he would get up and pray, and people who were discouraged by the events of the week and people that were, that were uh, having a difficult uh, time in their lives would find encouragement from Alexander White's pastoral prayers. But one Sunday morning, I mean, everybody thought, what in the world is he going to thank God for today? It was a cold, damp morning, and, and the crowd was sparse, and everybody was feeling kind of down, and they thought, wonder what he's going to say this morning. And so he said, let's pray. And he said, oh, God, we thank you that every Sunday isn't like this Sunday. <laughs> There's always something to thank God for. Give thanks in all circumstances. It's not give thanks for all circumstances. But give thanks in all circumstances. A young woman by the name of Ann Steele was a devout Christian who had gone through trouble after trouble in her life, but she'd met her great joy. She had, she'd met the Lord, of course, but now she'd met a young man who'd, who'd uh, wooed her and loved her and, and uh, uh, asked her to marry him. And the day had come. And she was looking forward to, uh, to a great wedding and marriage to follow. And, and she'd been come to the church and and uh, her, her attendants were there, and, and the guests were there, and he wasn't there. He's not usually late. They waited and waited, and about an hour later, someone came with the news that he had suddenly drowned. And I don't know the circumstances that would lead a groom to to drown on the wedding day, but 
he had drowned and she thought oh no a great joy has been taken from me what will I do God led her to sit down and write a hymn it's an old hymn and when I read the line she wrote, you may not recognize all the words. But catch her heart of gratitude to God, even in that difficult circumstance. She said, Father, what heir of earthly bliss thy sovereign will denies? Whatever you say no to, God, accepted at thy throne of grace, let this petition rise. He said, she says, oh, we're going to accept your will for us, God. And we're going we're to petition you, give me a calm, a thankful heart from every murmur free. The blessing of thy grace impart and make me live to thee. If you didn't get anything out else out of it, uh, get this. God help us not to murmur, murmur. You know how God feels about that? So you might have leftovers for lunch today, but let this be a warning to you. Don't scowl when you see the leftovers, okay? Thank God there's something left over. You know, maybe Cracker Barrel makes a great Thanksgiving dinner, but there's usually not enough leftovers now today. Wow, we had it, we had it Thanksgiving Day, and now today again, hallelujah. No murmuring, it's Thanksgiving. <laughs> in every circumstance, give thanks in all circumstances. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are with me in the midst of this difficult time. Thank you, Lord, that your grace is sufficient for me. A, a policeman was walking his beat in Chicago, and he saw this man standing outside a little mission in Chicago's south side. And the man had his hat in hand, and his eyes were closed, and he was murmuring. And the officer thought, is this guy drunk? What's going on? And he approached him, and he nudged him. He said, hey, Mac, what's wrong with you? He said, oh, oh I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, but my name is Billy Sunday. And years ago, right here, God saved me. And I just stopped to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you take your hat off to that? close your eyes and murmur a prayer god thank you lord for saving my soul thank you lord for making me whole did he do that for you, you say well not yet well ask him to he will he'll save you if you'll just invite him to do so receive him today trust christ as your Savior. It was many years ago. The scene was thick and the clouds were heavy. The sky was dark and the mood was tense. It was no time for a stroll in the park because the smell of death was in the air. A nation was at war with itself. Family against family a decision was essential paper and pen in hand a lean lank frame of a lonely man sat quietly at his desk the dispatch he wrote was sent immediately it shaped the destiny of that nation at war it was a simple message no satin frills, no flowery words, plain, direct, to the point. A bearded officer took the message and delivered it 
immediately. It was dated April 7, 1865. 1865. General Grant. General Sheridan says, if the thing is pressed, I think Lee will surrender. Let the thing be pressed. Signed, Abraham Lincoln. Short, to the point, simple. If the thing is pressed, I think that Lee will surrender. Let the thing be pressed. Grant did what he was ordered. And two days later, at Appomattox Courthouse, General Robert E. Lee surrendered. The thing was pressed. The war was over. The nation was again at peace. The words were so simple like these we read today. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let the thing be pressed. It's simple. Let's do it. Mona, would you come? I've asked Mona to read a portion of her newsletter she wrote. Uh, come right up, up here to the mic. We'll be fine, Mona. And with this, we close, and then we sing. Right here. that I wrote for November called Gratitude, the Game Changer. Do you ever feel like a loser? I do. Sometimes I fumble the ball and the cares of life pile up. Or maybe I just can't get my head in the game. You've heard that old expression, don't believe everything you read. How about this one? Don't believe everything you think. Don't believe everything you think. For most of us born in a fallen world, our thought default mode is set on negativity. We imagine the worst that can happen. We remember criticism longer than praise. We berate ourselves more than we would ever berate a friend. The switch to positive thinking requires intentional effort. The best way to retrain your brain is to show gratitude. You can't always change your circumstance, circumstances, but what you can change is your perception of those circumstances. So here's a very simple thing you can try. Have you seen these when they come out, these little simple composition books. Buy a hundred sheet wide ruled composition notebook. Draw a vertical line down the center of each page. Okay. Um, and so you write number one through 25 on one side and then 26 through 50 on the other. Then you flip it over to the back of the page and you just keep numbering. And if you go through the whole book that way, you will write down 10,000 things. Count your blessing, name them one by one. So my suggestion is, I like to write, but there's something about writing things down. So like every day, write down five things that you're thankful for. And last week we sang that song, 10,000 Reasons for My Heart to Sing. So if you finish this book, you will have 10,000 reasons for your heart to sing. So you might start off listing big things like your family, your friends, your health, your home, your country. But with time, you'll zero in on smaller, more specific blessings, such as a sunny walk in the woods, say with my husband, the fragrance of fresh basil, finding a good parking space downtown. 
receiving all of my luggage at the baggage claim. Or, or eating a delicious bowl of chicken tortilla soup. So when you fill up one page, just go down to the next page. Um, I wanted to close with one of my favorite passages about Thanksgiving. And it comes from a very old book called A Serious Call to a Devout, Devout and Holy Life. And this was published nearly 300 years ago. And it's written by a man named William Law. It's, it's a hard read, um, but I picked out just a few little tidbits, so here's one. If anyone would tell you the shortest, surest way to all happiness and all perfection, he must tell you to make a rule to yourself to thank and praise God for everything that happens to you. For it is certain that whatever seeming calamity happens to you, if you thank and praise God for it, you turn it into a blessing. Could you therefore work miracles? You could not do more for yourself than by this thankful spirit. For it heals with the word speaking and turns all that it touches into happiness. Thank you. What do we have to sing this morning? We're going to sing a different type of closing song this week. <laughs> um, so I've heard that once you get over a certain age, you just don't enjoy celebrating your birthday anymore. I don't know if that applies to everybody. <laughs> I don't know if that applies to everybody, but we're going to do it anyways, because we love you, and we appreciate you, and we want to wish you a happy birthday. So we need a C7 chord. Let's stand up, and let's sing a big happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Here, you hold this. Happy birthday, Pastor Paul. Happy birthday to you. And if you can't if you can't see the numbers, that's seven zero. <laughs> seven zero. So I <laughs> I encourage you as a church family this week, if you would. Uh, take it upon yourself to write a little note. It could be a card. It could be a note that you drop in his box here at the church sometime. You could send it through the mail. It could be a text. But let's shower uh, Pastor Paul and Shruti with some happy birthday wishes. It's technically tomorrow. Um, and some notes of encouragement and appreciation this week and show them our love as a church. Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a great week. Yeah. You're dismissed. <laughs>